and uh, welcome everyone to today's lunch talk. It is my pleasure to, to have Lika visiting virtually. Um, Lika Fanson is a, a graduate student at the CFA in Harvard, and uh, she's working on um, gravitational wave sources. They, and uh, <clears throat> Lika did her uh, master's, I think, in Leiden Observatory, and then uh, moved on to start the, the PhD in uh, the University of Amsterdam, uh, but a little bit quite early in this journey, uh, she moved to Harvard for uh, other reasons. And uh, <laughs> since then she, she's been doing some great work there uh, on uh, binary population synthesis and uh, black hole population synthesis. So um, I'm really happy to have Liki speak today and I hope that you all can get the chance to, uh, uh, to meet with her later today. So. Uh, with that, I go ahead and take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Elva, for this nice introduction. Um, yeah, I'm uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining today. Um, I am indeed a uh, fourth and now final year PhD student. Uh, and as I am nearing the end of my graduate studies and also uh, inevitably nearing my 30s, I got a renewed interest for 30 something black holes and what really causes them. Uh, so that's why I'm talking about that a little bit today. Um, but so first, um, why am I in general so excited about gravitational waves? Um, well, I think the the only and very clear way to show this is to just show the catalog of gravitational wave events that we have. So if you plot the size of the catalog against the expect uh, or the expected size of the catalog against time, then we know since the first detection in uh, 2015, we've seen exponential growth to about almost 100 detections of binary black holes, black hole neutron stars, and binary neutron stars today. Um, which is super exciting for people who think about massive stars, which are very difficult to capture. Um, and in a couple of months, the fourth um, catalog or the fourth run, 04, will start, which will uh, triple or even quadruple the sample that we currently have. Uh, but all of that's just the beginning because the following decade, we're expecting to have tens of mil uh, tens of thousands to millions of detections of these merging binary black holes, black hole neutron stars and binary neutron stars. So this incredibly large um, number of detections or this is expected explosion in detections really raises some fundamental questions um, in particular where do all these merging binary black holes come from? Um, now, many, many different formation channels have been proposed, but they all depend critically on their direct ancestors, namely massive stars. Now, massive stars are really cool because they impact nearly every part of modern astronomy. They shape our universe through all the elements and radiation in the uh, early universe that they emit and uh, in, in with which they enrich their surrounding gas. Um, but as I just mentioned as well, massive stars live fast and die young. And so that makes them really difficult to capture while alive. And so uh, all these detections raise a second quite fundamental questions. What can we learn from current and future gravitational wave detections about their stellar ancestors? Can, and if so, uh, how, can we use these gravitational wave observations to learn something about massive stars? Now, unfortunately, the fact that these double compact objects come from massive binary stars is both, or massive stars at least, is both a blessing and a curse because massive stars are really difficult. Uh, they uh, depend on all kinds of physics that occurs on largely varying scales, both temporal and spatial um, scales. So currently what we uh, mostly do, or what I specifically also do, is try to model or um, the evolution of these binaries or stars and capture all these difficult processes with very simple approximations that such that we can very rapidly um, model the population uh, behavior, which we can then compare to observations. Um, but 
many of these approximations are heavily oversimplified, or sometimes the physics is just plainly missing or have very outdated. Now, since we can't model uh, stars from uh, the mini, from the elements all the way up to cosmic scales at the moment, um, we need to uh, be a little bit smarter on how to tackle this uh, problem. And now there's basically two approaches. One is where you just vary all the uncertainties that we know of in all these approximations at one time and try to see if uh, any of those configurations match up with observations. But I would argue that we can try and be a little bit smarter and try to really figure out what are the dominant physical processes behind some of the observed features that we have. So, okay, what have we observed for our binary black holes so far? And I'm mostly focusing on black holes at the moment uh, because that's just where we by far have the most detections. But I think in the future, uh, black hole neutron stars and binary neutron stars are also very cool to do population statistics with. Now, luckily, black holes are pretty simple. And in principle, they only have a mass and a spin. But we're observing binary black holes, which means that there's a double compact object and we also have all kinds of binary properties. So the spin, as you might already see, is not just one spinning black hole, but it's the, uh, you measure the, something called the effective spin, um, which is a combination of both the spin magnitudes and the orientations of these spins. And they also have an eccentricity and a mass ratio. Um, now, LIGO, with LIGO, we really only see the last little bit of the in-spiral, which means that we're kind of not good at measuring the eccentricity, because at this last bit of the in-spiral, mostly the black holes will be circularized. Uh, so just the current instrument and experiments that we have are not optimized for measuring eccentricity. Uh, furthermore, to measure the spins and the mass ratio, um, there is this well-known degeneracy between measuring spins and uh, mass ratio. And so unless you manage to detect higher order multiples, it's very hard to constrain what the mass ratio really is, uh, which then makes it really difficult to say something definite about the spin. Um, and in general, spins have a relatively weak impact on the gravitational wave signal. So, um, all of that together makes it such that currently the masses of black holes are the best constrained properties. Um, so if we look at what we've learned about black hole mass distribution, black hole mass distribution over the past um, seven years now, um, then we see that um, we will see this best in the distribution of black hole masses. So this is the primary mass distribution. So the more uh, the distribution of the more massive black hole components, and each of the lines, the colors will be a different inference model. So something different assumed about uh, the underlying uh, population. And so these are observations from gravitational wave transient catalog one. Then we move to two point one. Uh, where there were also many different models used up until gravitational wave catalog three, which we have, uh, which is the most recent um, catalog from November 2021. And even though all these different models look slightly different, um, there's a lot of people, a lot of papers, and uh, basically most of the people in the literature now agree that there's two clear features that are seen in the mass distribution. There's one feature at the low masses, which is the global maximum of the binary black hole rate, which occurs at about 10 solar masses. And there's a second uh, local maximum, uh, which occurs at about 35 solar masses. Now, um, each of these uh, features um, portrays a different physics. So the dominant physics behind uh, the formation of each of these features uh, is different. And so they can teach us something uh, unique about the underlying binary or stellar physics. Um, for example, the low mass feature will teach us something about uh, supernova physics. For uh, Specifically, uh, it will tell us if there's a neutron star black hole mass gap or not, 
Or on the other hand, it will also tell us something most likely about isolated binary evolution because the low mass peak at 10 solar masses is almost certainly dominated by channels that come from isolated binary evolution. And um, I wrote a paper last year that said something about maybe this could even tell us something specifically about the stable mass transfer channel. So, um, but today my talk is called 30 something black holes. So as I said, I'm going to focus more on the higher mass systems, which are all these black holes with masses between of around 30 to 40 solar masses. Oh, sorry. Um, so what is the implication of the high mass feature? Well, in particular, uh, this high mass feature has been attributed to um, um, binary, sorry, has been attributed to parent stability supernova uh, many times, um, which means uh, if that is true, that actually has a lot of implications for all kinds of different physics. Um, not only does it matter for the formation channels, so which channels come from, or which of these black holes come from isolated binaries versus from dynamical formation channels, it also matters for uh, all these uh, papers that um, try to measure uh, cosmology with black holes using black holes at standard sirens. And um, it matters for the stellar deaths, like how will stars die and how will they form these black holes? Um, so this is why all the 35 solar mass peak when it was discovered it got so much attention and people got so excited about it because there's all these implications um and so for the longest time people have been very secure about this must be from parent stability but i'm going to go ahead and spoil my own talk by uh skipping ahead to the summary slide where I'm going to tell you right now that I think the 35 solar mass bump does not come from parent stability supernovae. Um, so uh, those of you in the audience who have heard many talks about this, they might be a little bit surprised, but uh, for other people, I'm going to first take a big step back and be very agnostic about how to form a bump at 35 solar masses. Okay. So in general, I think there's three different ways in which you can form such a pileup. The first one is uh, if it has to do something with the remnant mass function of uh, black holes. So the formation uh, or the function to map uh, stellar cores to black hole masses. And this is that first and most common a prediction of whether it could be coming from parent stability supernova. Now, what are parent stability supernova? Basically, if you have a star with a core that is massive enough, then uh, it will become the right temperature and pressure inside this uh, carbon oxygen core to allow for spontaneous pair production. So this means that the photons that were very much used to support your star against collapse will now suddenly transform into an electron positron pair. This causes this core to collapse at a premature state. Um, and this collapse can trigger oxygen ignition that causes the um, star and core to explode completely without leaving any remnant behind. Now, if your star stellar core is of a little bit lower mass, uh, then instead of disrupting the star altogether, what could happen is that you get a pulse. Uh, namely, you will still get this ex explosive oxygen ignition and you will uh, get a pulse that moves outwards. But instead of disrupting the star completely, it will just remove many layers of uh, the, stellar, the star and its mass, but it can afterwards uh, regain stability and go through uh, one or multiple of these cycles before finally collapsing to a black hole of a somewhat lower mass. So the existence of such uh, parent stability supernova have been or uh, predicted since the 60s. Um, and the expected effect on a black hole mass remnant distribution is as follows. Um, this is a beautiful cartoon from Farag 
2022, where they show the remnant mass on the y-axis and the core mass or the initial mass on the x-axis. And as we move to higher and higher uh, core and star stellar masses, you move from a regime where you have normal core collapse supernova to a regime where you will lose some of the mass to these pair pulsations, which cause you to expect a maximum black hole mass at a certain point, after which you will drop and form no black holes whatsoever. Um, that is uh, where you have this complete parent stability supernova. And in reality, we actually expect that if you go to high enough masses, you will once again form a, um, a black hole mass um, with the stellar cores because photo disintegration will take over and will basically prevent you from even doing this whole uh, um, core collapse and oxygen ignition because the core will just be completely photo disintegrated at these very, very high temperatures. And this is why we usually call it the parent stability supernova gap. Now, the shape of the remnant mass distribution where you, in other words, how will you map the CO cores or the core masses to final black hole remnant masses determines what kind of feature you would expect in the black hole mass distribution. And the key feature here is this little bit where there is a degeneracy between multiple CO core masses leading to a small range of about the same black hole masses. And so um, if the shape of this remnant mass function is very broad, you expect a somewhat higher pileup because there's more CO core masses leading to the same um, black hole mass uh, right before the complete um, breakdown where you have the parent stability gap. If this is a somewhat sharp feature, you only have a few CO core masses uh, that will lead to degeneracy. And so you expect a feature that looks a little bit more something like a knee. And over the past years, Many people have done a lot of population synthesis studies uh, to see what the effect would be of different uh, parent stability models. This is an example from Simon Stevenson in 2019, where he used many different parent stability models and looked at what the peak would be looking like. And similarly, a more recent study by Yoro et al. 2022, which is a, a different code, namely the seven code which uses interpolated stellar tracks. Um, and they again look at where you would expect this um, pileup depending on these two um, parent stability mechanisms. So what actually determines the shape of this remnant mass function of the parent stability gap? Well, um, uh, the parent stability uh, prediction is actually one of the most pro robust predictions that we have for massive stars. Um, namely, this prediction is robust against uh, variations over the winds, the metallicities, the rotation of these cores, and neutrino physics, convection, as long as you just end up with a certain uh, carbon oxygen core of a certain mass, you will expect to find uh, this parent stability gap. Um, now, uh, this has been shown uh, in particular by Rob Farmer and all, um, but there's just one uncertainty left, and that uncertainty is the nuclear reaction rate. Namely, how much carbon or oxygen do you have in your core at the moment of parent stability? And uh, you might be surprised, like at least I was the first time I heard uh, that we don't really know what the carbon oxygen rate is exactly, because uh, it's really difficult to do these reactions on, uh, on Earth. Uh, so we really need a, a star to create these uh, proper uh, conditions, like the temperature and pressure. Uh, and so there's a range of uh, carbon oxygen rates that we expect to happen, where this plot from Rob again shows uh, the carbon oxygen rate 
minus the expected value minus three sigma, which means more carbon in the core, and plus three sigma, which means more oxygen in the core. And you see that the rate of the carbon oxygen uh, reaction determines the lower and upper mass gap of uh, the parent stability uh, gap. And it can go all the way up to 100 if you lower the amount of uh, oxygen in the core. And it can it will kind of stabilize at around 45-ish if you add more oxygen in the core. And so to go back to the black holes, we expect a feature to happen just below the edges of this gap. Uh, it's, it's quite a narrow feature in this case. But now comes the real fun. Um, last year, Meta et al. published a follow-up paper to Rob's work where they said, this is really great, but the reaction rates that you were using were those from Kunz et al. 20, uh, 2002 and updated rates from De Boer et al. Uh, 2017 um, will actually shift the carbon oxygen uh, rates and thus also shift the expected location of the gap. And this has become even more pronounced in a later study by Farag et al., who tried to really resolve the location of this gap and did a really detailed study uh, of all these different masses and carbon oxygen rates where they increased the mass and temporal resolution and also additionally varied the triple alpha rate, which also produces uh, carbon. And so that is the yellow line that you see on top, which is an extra variation um, that hadn't been shown before. And you might, as you might see, the expected fiducial location of the parent stability mass gap is now shifted from about 45 to 60 to 70 solar masses, which is much, much higher than the 35 solar masses that we're looking for. And it's, even if you go to plus three sigma, you'll still see expected to be at about 46 if you uh, are lucky. And so to quantify this, um, David Hendricks, who is a PhD student uh, in Surrey is actually doing some uh, very cool work where he's trying to see how much would we need to push this carbon oxygen rates or this parent stability uh, function to get something that looks like uh, the peak at 35 solar masses. And so this shows uh, a, again, binary population synthesis model of the um, binary black hole mergers uh, where the old fiducial is this blue line, which is the farmer 2019 rates, uh, but the expected uh, new should be fiducia, or these new preferred models by Farag et al, bring the gap all the way to somewhere around here. And as you can see in here, you would have to shift the location of the gap by more than 25 solar masses to the left to get something that looks like this uh, gap location. Well, that's kind of... Uh, unprobable, if you would ask me. Um, are there any other ways in which we could still use the random mass function to get a gap? Well, one possibility is that maybe um, it's not so much the maximum black hole mass that creates this pileup, but it's the first peak, this transition, or the first uh, star that goes undergoes a parent stability pulsation um, that creates a degeneracy because you would be, oh, sorry, you would be switching from core collapse supernovae, which give you just straight line. And if you have a strong first pulse, you would move to a somewhat lower black hole mass again and create a second uh, degeneracy. Um, now, this is something that we saw in uh, one of our um, one paper where we accidentally put in a, a discontinuous function between the core collapse and parent stability. Um, so could this then maybe, as this happens at much lower CO core masses, could that then maybe be at the right location and cause such a pileup at 35 solar masses? Well, in principle, there's nothing saying that really it can't, but I think the probability of this happening is very low. 
uh, both because uh, the Farag rates shift the whole um, expected location of parent stability to be happening, so also the lower edge. Um, and secondly, uh, I think a, a big jump that is big enough to create such a bump as we have in this model are quite unrealistic. In uh, more realistic models, we expect this transition or the first pulse to only uh, remove about three or less solar masses, which wouldn't create such a big uh, enough jump for you to get a pileup. Okay, so that means we have to go back to the drawing board and think about other things of how could we create a pileup or a bump at 35 solar masses. Now, one common critique that I always get is from people saying, well, you know, models showing these, these black hole distributions from population synthesis, it's just all super uncertain. You can just fiddle with other things and vary more parameters, and then you'll get a different answer. And it's true, I concern, I share your concern with a lot of these uncertainties that are hidden in population synthesis. Um, but one of the most common things that uh, people say is, uh, well, maybe it is, uh, you could still shift this uh, location of uh, parent stability by shifting the metallicities that you find. Because, you know, maybe if you just have the right combination of uh, winds and stellar metallicities, you can have the location of the peak still be at lower masses. Um, now, what, what does this stem from? Um, well, basically, um, the predictions that we make depend indeed heavily on the metallicity-dependent cosmic star formation history. That's a mouthful, but what does that just mean? That means that if you plot the uh, time of the universe um, against uh, the metallicity, then the metallicity with which stars form uh, looks a little something like this. It, the universe started out forming uh, stars very metal poor uh, and ended up uh, forming stars at high metallicity, similar to uh, solar metallicity day. And the shape of this function heavily affects the binary black hole merger rate because of the metallicity dependence in binary black hole merger, uh, binary black hole formation. Uh, and moreover, the exact shape, although we know it goes up, but the exact distribution towards lower metallicities is uh, unknown or very uncertain. And specifically, how many stars are born with low metallicity today or how fast this uh, distribution goes up uh, is very difficult to measure uh, with observations. And I should have Quoted, but you should really look at some of the work of Martina Kruszlinska, who's done uh, a lot of great work on uh, constraining this function. Now, how do you capture this uncertainty in the black hole distribution? Um, there's many, many different uh, formation channels that have been proposed, uh, or sorry, many, many different uh, methods that have been proposed to capture this metallicity dependent cosmic star formation history. But what we did in this work is uh, just try and make it as simple as possible by capturing this in a uh, analytical expression that depends uh, of two components, uh, one being the overall cosmic star formation rate density, so how many storm stars form at what redshift, and one that tells you the distribution of metallicities at each redshift. So how many, what metallicity will your stars form with at each redshift? Um, now, the benefit of such a simple model is that it can be easily updated when new information becomes available. So, for example, as JWST is now measuring more and more really cool high redshift uh, galaxies, uh, we can place constraints on this uh, analytical function because it's very flexible. Uh, and the second is that it's also, because it's so flexible, it allows for a very easy uh, systemic variation, systematic variation, um, to see what the effect would be of uh, changing the cosmic star formation history. And so we did exactly that second thing, where we basically fitted our 
uh, cosmic star formation history to uh, a uh, cosmic sim simulation, sorry, a cosmological simulation, namely the TNG 100 simulation. Um, and the result is shown here. So this is again the black hole mass distribution and in gray it's the observations and in dark blue it's a binary population model using this cosmic star formation history. And now that you've set a fiducial, you can vary the fiducial star formation um, parameter by parameter. So for example, here we varied the width of the metallicity distribution at redshift zero over uh, widths that are allowed by observations. So anything that's reasonable by observations still. And you can play the same game by varying the cosmic star formation history, not only over the width of the metallicity, but also, for example, the mean of the metallicity at redshift zero, the evolution, how fast it decays with redshift, uh, the overall star formation history, etc. And by doing this, we found a really cool result that uh, even though indeed the metallicity distribution has a very large effect on the rate of binary black hole mergers, um, the location of features does not change with changing the metallicity distribution. And so I'm flipping over the different uh, variations that we have here. I've just highlighted one feature, the low mass feature in this case, because it's most clear in these models. I'm going to flip back and forth, but you'll see that the only thing that the metallicity distribution does is change the rates up and down or the different features up and down, but it doesn't shift them left or right. So if you want to, if you expect the location from physics, stellar physics to be at a certain mass at 65, then you could boost or uh, reduce this feature with the metallicity distribution, but you can't shift it left or right. Okay, so let's take a little break and summarize a little bit of this first bit. Uh, LIGO, Virgo, Kagura have found a binary black hole, uh, a feature in the binary black hole mass distribution at about 35 solar masses. Most state-of-the-art uh, parent stability models predicts a peak or a feature to be at 55 to 65 model uh, solar masses. So about 20 to 30 solar masses higher. Um, and the location of this peak feature or the location of features in general do not depend on um, uncertainties in the cosmic star formation history. Rather, they show something about the underlying binary physics. Um, okay, so what kind of implications does this have uh, if the parent stability or this peak is really not from parent stability? Well, you might have heard of a little binary black hole merger called GW190521, <laughs> which this massive beast of binary black hole merger uh, was a merger between a 66 solar mass black hole and an 85 solar mass black hole. And so this was such a surprise based off of uh, parent stability uh, models that um, it made headlines even outside of astronomy, which as you can see at this New York Times article uh, from back then. Um, and uh, I would say that now that the location of the gap has shifted up to about 66 solar mass, 65 to solar masses, this releases some of the tension of this massive black hole because it would mean that you don't need to have both black holes to be formed in the gap. It only means that one of the two components is a gap uh, black hole and the other one is uh, just from normal stellar evolution, could be from normal stellar evolution. Now, over the past uh, few years, people have been super excited about explaining things in the gap, because of course, if the peak is at 35 and it comes from parent stability, then everything above 35 solar masses has to come from other formation channels, cannot come directly from uh, core collapse uh, black holes, uh, stellar stars that collapse. 
Uh, and so there's been many different formation channels proposed to put black holes in the gap. Um, and this slide is probably very outdated by now because people have been coming up with new ideas. Uh, but I uh, would argue that in general, you can subdivide these uh, different channels within two or uh, three main categories where the first is you form your black hole below or outside the gap, but you grow it through accretion post formation, post black hole formation. The second is you avoid parent stability either by being a primordial black hole and not knowing anything of parent stability or by being a star that has a really tiny core that is too low for parent pulsations to happen and a very overmassive envelope. And then if you believe that the envelope can fall back completely during black hole formation, you will also get something in the gap. And lastly, which most commonly is uh, assumed, I think, are uh, what if it's second generation mergers? So you merge two black holes, they form a black hole in the gap, and then you merge them again, which ha happens in dynamical environments. Um, I want to highlight two things here. First of all, all of these channels do still need a dynamical environment to bring black holes close enough to get you to a merger. Uh, so these are all kind of dynamical uh, channels. And secondly, um, even though there's all this work that's being done to push things in the gap, uh, none of these will ever get you a lower mass. So none of these will actually push the gap feature to lower masses. And so it, I think it's, again, very unlikely that the 35 solar mass uh, peak can be coming from uh, per pulsations in this case. Um, another more direct implication of the, the shifts in the expected location of the pair instability um, gap uh, is, of course, the transient rates, and namely the rates of pair instability supernova that we expect. If you shift um, the uh, pair instability rate from uh, something like this dashed line, which is more comparable to the farmer model before, to uh, higher CO core masses, which are rarer because of the uh, IMF, the initial mass function, you will also expect to see less, a lot less fair instability supernovae happening. On the other hand, the core collapse supernova rate is barely affected. Uh, basically not affected because the core collapse supernovae uh, are primarily coming from stars at, with masses that are much lower than those stars that form parent stability supernovae. Uh, similarly, the rates of neutron stars, well, binary neutron stars and black hole neutron stars com are completely unaffected, but even the rates of binary black hole mergers will barely vary which And this is because if you look at the mass distribution or the rate distribution of black holes, then um, the secondary peak at the local maximum at 35 solar masses is at least an order of magnitude in rates lower than the global peak. And if you move this further and further down, it will just be a smaller and smaller fraction of the total rates. So you don't really see this effect in the total rates. Okay, so one last time, let's go back to the drawing board and think, how could we form such a pileup? And I think there's only one uh, option left, and that is picky pairing. So basically, different formation channels like to form merging black holes with different partners. And uh, again, many different formation channels have been proposed, and at the moment, None of these have a very clear prediction for why there should be a peak at 35 solar masses. So I think this is exciting because this means that it's time for theorists like us to go back out again and try and find out if there's a reason why we'd expect uh, a bump at 35 solar masses. So although I don't have a straight answer of what could form it, I do have some clues, at least from isolated binary uh, evolution, which is my expertise. So basically, you can for, uh, subdivide the channels that lead to merging binary black holes from isolated binaries into two main channels. 
one channel is where the binaries go into mass transfer and lose angular momentum through a common envelope, which is commonly known as the common envelope channel. And the other is where the binaries never go into unstable mass transfer. So they never enter a common envelope, but they only experience places of stable mass transfer, which can also lead to the binary orbit shrinking, uh, but will lead to very different uh, binary separations and thus uh, different um, merger rates and uh, properties. And in particular, one property that's different between these channels is the expected masses. Um, or more generally, we expect that the common envelope channel is really bad at forming high mass black holes. And this was a result from a paper from, 20, uh, from last year as well, um, that well came out in 2021 already. But basically the reason why common envelope uh, uh, the common envelope channel is really difficult at uh, or bad at forming high mass black holes uh, has a number of underlying contributors. Um, I'll try to take you through this, but it's a little bit technical. But in principle, you need very high mass stars to form very high mass black holes. Now, these high mass stars typically don't have much of a very big fluffy envelope. They have a lot of wind stripping. They lose, uh, they enter the Humphrey Davidson regime. Uh, and so you don't expect them to find them as very large uh, red giants. Um, then secondly, these stars don't like to engage into a common envelope because they're usually quite hot and don't have a deep enough convective envelope to uh, initiate unstable mass transfer. Even if they do, which is the third reason, they are then very unlikely to survive such a common envelope. Uh, because again, these hot, more radiative envelopes have a higher uh, binding energy. And so you will more likely just merge the system altogether. Uh, and lastly, uh, forming one massive black hole on the from the primary and then going a uh, common envelope from the secondary is also quite unlikely due to the mass ratios that are required would be uh, still leading to a merger. Uh, and uh, there's often, if there's any mass accretion during the first mass transfer, you will also end up with systems that have to go through the same steps one, two, and three. So if you take anything away from this, just remember common envelope channel is bad at forming high mass black holes. And this result has actually been uh, seen and confirmed by multiple independent uh, groups and codes over the last couple of years, where it's also been seen in the redshift evolution by Michela Mapelli using the MOPSI code. It's shown by uh, Bril, Max Bril in uh, uh, using BPASS, which uses the STARS evolutionary code under uh, all this uh, population synthesis. So STARS is a more detailed code. Um, and it's also been seen in a work by Chris Belchinski uh, using the Star Trek code. So, uh, okay, I would say if you're looking for uh, forming a, a peak at 35 solar masses using uh, isolated binaries, you probably want to be looking at um, the stable mass transfer channel. Uh, and actually, Max Briel has uh, been looking at this as well. And this is the same paper as here, where he argues, or they find in their BPASS models, that they could find a pileup, form a pileup, not through pair instability, but through a complicated combination of super Eddington accretion, uh, stable mass transfer, and chemically homogeneous evolving stars. Now, I'm not going to walk you through this whole uh, cartoon because it's quite difficult. Uh, and in the end, it does still depend very heavily on your assumptions about how uh, chemically homogeneous evolving stars work and if super Eddington accretion is really a thing. Um, but I do want to highlight that I personally think that chemically homogeneously evolving stars are a good candidate because they form black hole masses of about 30 to 40 solar masses. Um, but the problem with chemically homogeneously evolving stars is that we've never actually seen one. Uh, we don't have a, a confirmed observation of a chemically homogeneously evolving system to date. 
And that's why I want to, oh, sorry, highlight some work from a student, uh, Katie Sharp, that I'm working with, uh, who is visiting in California. So you might have seen her around if you were, I think she was in Caltech this week um, for grad school uh, admissions. Um, but in any case, she was exploring uh, models of chemically homogeneously evolving stars and grids of such stars to try and see if we can confirm or uh, explain the one of the strongest candidates for chemically homogeneous evolution, which is AD 15, HD 5980. Uh, and this just shows some of the uh, results of different grids where the blue uh, ranges show chemically homogeneous evolving stars and the gray shows non-chemically homogeneous evolving stars. So stay tuned for that paper. Um, and I think chemically homogeneous evolving stars are cool. Um, so back to the summary. Uh, once again, I stay stick with, I don't think the 35 solar mass bump comes from parapulsational supernova, uh, both because state of the art um, uh, models for parent stability supernova shift the gap to much higher masses. And this is something that I don't expect will be uh, shifted around by uh, metallicity. It really is uh, uh, the dominant physics underneath that we need to find. Um, so secondly, we need a new explanation for these 30-something black holes. Uh, so please, uh, dynamicist people in the audience, anyone who has great ideas, I'd love to hear them. Uh, I think it's really exciting, especially um, because from the isolated perspective, I only know that the common envelopes are most likely not the right way to form these. Uh, so it would be stable mass transfer or chemically homogeneous evolving systems. Uh, but maybe there is something in the way that clusters form or in the way that AGN disks form black hole mergers. Um, and the last point is that since 04 is starting in a couple of months, um, and we will triple or quadruple the number of systems that we have, there's a lot of hope for uh, really resolving this peak even further and maybe even seeing a feature at 50 or 60 solar masses, which would be really exciting because then we could see the real pair instability supernova gap. All in all, I think it's a really exciting time to be working on all of this. And I wanna thank you all for your attention and would love to hear, hear any questions. Thank you so much Ike, um, uh, for the great talk. Um, anybody has any uh, questions immediately? I can start with asking a question. So Ike, in your mass distribution, there is some other features um, mm -hmm. that appear. Like, um, yes. for example, you have the first peak and then you have like a little minimum and then there comes a hump. Uh, <laughs> do you know what's up here? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I'm looking into this, um, but I only know. So uh, there's two things. Uh, firstly, the thing that I'm showing here is only stable mass transfer. So I'm not showing common envelope systems. Uh, so if you add on common envelopes, you will get a, this will fill in because you will get a big peak here. Mm -hmm. But then secondly, this hump that is appearing here, actually, uh, as far as I've been seeing, is related to the mass transfer efficiency. So uh, black holes in this peak, the primary mass comes from the firstborn black hole, but black holes in this peak, the binaries come from the secondborn black hole, which becomes the more massive black hole due to accretion. Now I don't really understand completely why it is there, um, why it's specifically at 20 solar masses, uh, so I don't trust it completely unless I really understand it. But the hints are it has to do with uh, the amount of accretion that you allow, and it, it will go away if you have uh, no mass transfer. So if the stars during the first mass transfer cannot accrete anything, sorry, so if, if it's completely non-conservative, always. Um, but yeah, I think in the... In, in order to solve this, I want to look a little bit more in detail also about the mass first mass transfer phase and think more not just with population synthesis, but also with other codes of how much we would really expect there. Okay, yes. 
Um, any other questions? <coughs> yes, please. <laughs> Ops meetings. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm on the wrong account. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, hard my ignorance, but what is a chemically homogeneous oh, volume sorry. system? Never heard of that. Oh, that's completely on me. I'm so sorry. I was I thought I wouldn't make it through the slides, to be fair. So I thought, okay, I, I, <laughs> I should have done more introduction. So basically, normally we assume that stars form with a core and an envelope. Uh, and the burning, all the burning of the star happens in the core. Uh, and then all the rest of the evolution of what the evolution or the star looks like is determined by the envelope because that's what we are looking at. However, if you um, rotate stars very fast, they get squished and the squishing causes a temperature gradient. So the tops will be hotter, the poles will be harder and the outsides will be cooler. And this is something, this induces something called Eddington sweet circulations. But basically it just means that because there's a temperature gradient, there will be a flow of, of mass. Uh, and this flow will mix the envelope with the core and thereby mixing all the core uh, burning products with the envelope, leaving no envelope whatsoever, but leaving a star that's completely chemically homogeneous. And so these chemically homogeneous stars, because they mix everything through, they form much more massive black holes than we normally expect from single stars. So normal stars, we expect them to form black holes more around 10 solar masses and decay fast, because, but this mixing will give you much higher mass um, stars and black holes, higher mass cores and also black holes. Uh, and um, they also live a very different life from more normal stars. Uh, which is why they're very cool, uh, but have not been confirmed. It's very difficult to co confirm them observationally. Okay, thanks. So, Lika, do you know um, how come here in Max's simulations, I think it was in the previous slide, mm -hmm. um, how he managed to make the, the peak align there? Yeah, so uh, basically what they find is that um, there's a bunch of stars that go chemically homogeneous. And this is what you see here. Um, but then uh, oh, it's, such a diff it's a really a complicated uh, connection of a lot of things. So the, the way that they define chemically homogeneous the evolving star is based off of uh, some rotation rates that then um, makes it very like, yes, you're chemically homogeneous or no, you're not chemically homogeneous. Uh, and then uh, by combining the stellar winds, they push it down a little bit. And then with the uh, stable mass transfer, it pushes it up again because they accrete during the, the black hole accretes during the stable mass transfer. And all of these things together happen to align in a cosmic way such that you get a peak at uh, 35 solar masses. But if you change, in my, in my opinion, I think if you change any of these assumptions, so the assumption about how much mass is accreted onto the black hole, so how much super Eddington it is, or how strong the stellar winds are, or when stars are, go chemically homogeneous, you will change the location of the peak in that model. Uh, so it's not a very, uh, I would say it's not a, a very robust way of making this peak, but it's interesting to see a different way of forming the peak, or at least in a, a first try. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um... If there are no other questions, let's thank Lika again. And please remember uh, that there is still some slots on her schedule. So you can sign up and meet with Lika. Thank you so much, Thanks Lika. All. Thanks. Thank Have you. a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you.